Make sure you never miss an FX Medicine episode by subscribing to us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You can follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram. Hi, and welcome to FX Medicine, where we bring you the latest in evidence-based integrative, functional, and complementary medicine. FX Medicine acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia where we live and work, and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to the elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Angelo Ratnachandra is a physiotherapist and counsellor with over 20 years of experience in helping people with chronic illness and in particular chronic pain. He is a founder of Beyond Pain, a clinic located in Victoria specialising in tailored programs for the treatment of chronic pain, chronic fatigue and mental health conditions. Angelo is an award-winning therapist and someone who has personally experienced substantial chronic pain in his life. He is the author of the book Beyond Pain, where Angelo takes readers through his journey with pain and then provides invaluable information about the treatment of chronic pain and the important connection between the mind and the body. I've just finished reading his book and I must admit that it is a great resource for practitioners and patients. It is Angelo's experience on both sides of the chronic pain treatment room that we want to discuss today. Welcome to FX Medicine, Angelo. Thanks for being with us today. Oh, thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to have you. So, uh, I mean, I'm curious because I know that, you know, obviously you trained as both a physiotherapist and a counsellor specialising in chronic pain, um, but I know that early on in your career you experienced some very traumatic events that have un- undoubtedly affected your life. Can you tell us a bit about this? Yeah, sure. Uh, look, um, I've had chronic pain for about 18 years now, so um, I guess the m- most major incident that I had a few events in my life, but the major, most major one was um, back on the 23rd of June 2006. So I was um, living and working in London at the time as a physio, ironically working in pain management. And one Friday night, I was sitting at home watching TV and someone broke the window and threw a Molotov cocktail at my head. Um, they got the wrong house. So it basically, the, the cocktail uh, deflected off my arms as I went to put my arms up to protect my face, hit the back wall and smashed, and I got shot in petrol, and next thing I knew I was set alight. Um, so, yeah, wow. I had to put the – yeah, um, I had to put the fire out using my hands and run upstairs into the bathtub and, and wait till the ambulance came along, and then they ended up being in a burns unit and had to have some skin grafts and a long recovery post that. Wow. So how long were you in hospital for? Um, I was in an acute burns unit for about – two weeks, a week week to two weeks. And then uh, subsequently I had to have outpatients for about six months, three times a week, you know, having morphine shots and then cleaning the wounds. And then sub- during that period I had to have skin graft as well. So you experienced then obviously uh, on the other side and you're, you're actually a patient on, on this occasion. What was that like for you being a patient of, of pain? Yeah, look, it's a, definitely an eye-opening experience. I mean, we all experience pain to a degree, but when you're, have that level of pain um, and subsequent recovery and rehab, it, you really get an opportunity, um, you know, you, you really do um, sort of walk the path of your clients and, and you've got to implement what you practice. So you've got to walk the talk mm-hmm. uh, when you're the patient. Um, and that was my first hospital visit. It was eight months prior to I had a collapsed lung. It was a, they call it a spontaneous pneumothorax. Um, and I, I don't fit the criteria for it. I just had one and, yeah, I had to end up in hospital for five months. Oh, sorry, five weeks. Um, yeah, eight months earlier. So um, I wasn't yeah. a stranger to hospital. So yeah, it was just uh, learning the ropes of what it was like being a patient and and the recovery process and and what mm-hmm. we needed to do to get back on our feet. And what was your experience as you know with regard to the treatment that they offered in terms of the management of the acute pain as opposed to the management of the chronic pain? What was this, the hospital like and the medical practitioners like in terms of managing that? Um, well, look, the hospitals generally go with the medication route. Um, you know, I was very fortunate that I worked in pain management, so I was able to recognise what else we needed to do and what I needed to do from a you know psychosocial perspective to keep my mind active and and, and things like that. But Generally speaking, the hospitals go for first line of treatment, which is the medication and the strong meds. And 
And as you know, with strong medications, there's lots of side effects too, which I, I wasn't a stranger to, and I had to manage all of that. So it really gave me a, a great insight as to, you know, there is a place for medications, there is a place for supplements, there's a place for everything, but it's just about finding the right balance. Okay. So, so was there, in, in terms of that experience, obviously, uh, with pain, and I mean, is that something that you still suffer from? Do, you, do the, uh, the burns still continue to create pain for you? Yeah, um, look, I do have chronic pain as, from the burns. I also get other sensations like one side of my face, you know, heats up in the sun faster than the other. So it feels like I've got like cling wrap uh, on one side of my face sometimes. And, um, you know, my arms, I get different sensations depending on sometimes the weather affects it. You know, I get some tingling or electric sparks going down my arm. So you get different sensations, um, not just mm -hmm. pain as we know it. But, yeah, certainly um, – and, and certainly, you know, um, when you're stressed and upset, you, you tend to see feel more pain as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I just recently read your book, and it's a it's a great read. I'd certainly recommend it for anybody that for both, I think, practitioners and for for clients. I think there's some some valuable um, information in there, and, and just your story too. I think it's inspiring in the, in the fact that you know, obviously, as a practitioner and a patient, you know, it, it obviously gets you a level of insight and, and uh, empathy that, you know, many people who don't experience th that pain would, would have. So is there anything that you learnt from being on both sides of the couch, you know, that, you, that impacts on how you work with your clients now? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think we've got to look beyond... The, the physical aspects of pain. Uh, I think, you know, we've got to look at, uh, I'm very big on the fact that we need to look at the person, not their painful body part or their diagnosis. Um, you know, pain impacts not just that physical sensation of pain, but it impacts someone's whole life, um, impacts their work, impacts their social life, personal mm -hmm. life, their mindset, um, and vice versa. So, you know, in terms of uh, an approach, we need to really look at a holistic approach to pain management, whether it's acute or chronic, um, and yeah, as opposed to just focusing on from like a medical model of, okay, well, here's where the problem is, let's try and fix that problem there. And when you say a holistic approach, like what areas do you think are really important components of a, of a pain management uh, treatment? Um, I think, you know, uh, physical and psychological and social, uh, all the above. Um, so, you know, we've got to look at uh, how someone's mentally impacted by pain, how they're socially impacted by pain, and physically. We need to look at exercises, stretches, um, you know, mindfulness techniques, relaxation techniques, um, you know, getting them reconnected with society. Uh, because often a lot of people with chronic pain uh, – become isolated. Uh, one, yeah. people say that, you know, if other people can't see their pain, they don't understand their pain, which is true. Um, mm -hmm. So they try and keep to themselves. But it's really important to reconnect with society and, and get back to some level of norm despite the pain. Yeah. So so you went then back and at some point you you trained as a counsellor? Is, is, how did that happen and when did, when did that occur? Oh, look, it happened years later, but I think um, – with the insights I got from working in a, an international renowned pain clinic, working closely with psychologists and, and other physios and other allied health, you, you, it really cemented my, my view that, you know, tackling pain, whether it's acute or chronic, needs to be a holistic approach. And, and while I got the skills and the tools from these other practitioners, I really wanted to get a, a, a good framework and a, and a good base of support. So I went back to university and, and started and did a counselling sort of course and to, to complement my physiotherapy knowledge and expertise. So do you think the uh, holistic approach is something that pain management practitioners or, or people working in the pain area, are they utilising a holistic approach nowadays or do you think it's still kind of medication management and acute pain management and, you know, what are you seeing in that area? Um, I think I think we are moving towards a more holistic approach. There's some good pain management programs where there's different disciplines uh, like physiotherapists, psychologists, exercise physiologists, OTs, et cetera. Uh, that's part of the, a team. Um, I think, but there's still a big focus on intervention um, and 
uh, in, when I say intervention, I'm talking about injections, medications, etc. Now, I'm not against any of that. I think there's definitely a place for it. But I think yep. perhaps what we need to look at is look at, at a non-invasive approach first, perhaps with medication and perhaps with an allied health sort of uh, 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 biopsychosocial approach before we jump the gun and go to surgery and injections and things like that. I think there's a there's definitely an opportunity to fine tune that and and perhaps get people into a more structured routines and give them some skills in pain management complement anything further that they may need to have. I mean, my background is I'm a clinical psychologist. So obviously, you know, you know we're at the emotional side and the psychological side that it can mm-hmm. have on, on both physical and mental disease. So um, how do you explain that? Like if you've got then somebody coming in with chronic pain or, or um, and they're coming to see you as a client and then you start talking about uh, thoughts and emotions and feelings. Like, how do you explain how that impacts on pain? Um, look, I, I, I do live by a quote from Aristotle about 2,000 years ago. He said, treatment of the part should never be attempted without the treatment of the whole. That's the error of our ways, the separation of the body from the soul. And so I think a lot of people with chronic pain understands that the pain is exhausting, both mentally and physically. And, and if you actually... I talk to my clients about the fact that when they're feeling stressed and angry or upset or frustrated, do they feel more pain or less pain? And more often than not, they'll say they feel more pain. Whereas if they're happy yeah. or distracted or amongst friends and family or doing something that they enjoy, how do they feel then? Um, and that's, you know, and then they recognize that, oh, well, the mood can impact their pain. They might still have pain, but certainly the intensity of the pain may be different depending on your mood. Um, and I think, People, tend, people do understand that, especially with someone who had chronic pain for a long time. They've gone through the ups and downs in terms of mood and, and I think they can see what's going on. Uh-huh. And what's the mechanism? Like how, how does our mood impact on pain, like from a physiological point of view? What's going on there? Oh, well, um, the brain is an interesting beast, isn't it? So, I mean, the, the reality is you when you're happy or excited or um feeling good you you release your natural painkillers the endorphins and that and that's why sometimes some people are on low dose antidepressants for pain management it's not necessarily because they're depressed but the medications actually allow you to release chemicals in the brain uh that makes you feel good and what that does is essentially shuts well tries to uh limit or shuts down some of the pain pathways um, so you feel good, um, you don't feel the pain as much because those endorphin releases there. You feel stressed, the body is in a heightened state, it wants to know everything it needs to know about pain because pain evolutionary is a defense mechanism, right? If you you know you put your fingers in a in a in a stove, you get burnt or it's hot, you, you withdraw it. It's a it's a defense mechanism. So the brain inherently thinks any type of pain is, is is a danger to you, not and it doesn't know the difference between you know danger type pain versus say chronic non danger type pain. Uh, mm-hmm. Pain is pain for the brain, so um, I think it's that endorphin release and the type of chemical balance that you have. You know, are you a highly stressed person versus are you understanding of your pain? You got feel like you got control of it, or do you feel you know, you don't have control of it. So it's the release of chemicals that can impact mm-hmm. the physiological pathways, yeah. And is it just endorphins or there is other kind of chemicals that you think play an important part in that in that pain, uh, emotion? Yeah, I mean, you know, the endorphins and the painkillers are the ones that makes you feel sort of good, the adrenaline, et cetera. But then you've got yep. um, chemicals like cortisol, which has the opposite effect. It's more of a... a, a it's a stress hormone. It's a slow releasing. It, it makes you more alert. It's it sort of redirects blood to your muscles, makes them more tense, and so you fatigue more. Um, you know, it reduces blood flow to the brain and things like that. So that could then cause you to have the brain fog, etc. And it keeps you awake at night um, because it's an alert hormone. So then you don't sleep well, and then the next day you probably feel worse. So um, I think there's a uh, intricate interplay of chemicals and um, neurotransmitters and, and different substances in the brain that, and we're still learning about it. We're, st- you know, it's yeah. still being uncovered. So, with then, if from a psychological perspective, if um, you're seeing somebody, we're seeing a, a client, you're 
But what kind of techniques are you teaching them to help manage that pain and 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 work on the emotional side of things? What what things are you doing with them? Um, look, I, I generally try and refer them off to a psychologist or a counsellor mm. um, because that's their expertise. But in terms of just trying to calm the mind about doing some quick relax techniques, just some breathing techniques. Uh, we know it's deep breathing, square breathing techniques can help, um, you know, focusing on something enjoyable or, or a distraction technique, you know, listening to music. Music is great. Listen to favourite band or things like that. Um, or give them some, you know, cognitive behavioural or acceptance commitment sort of strategies to look at, mm-hmm. you know, challenging unhelpful thoughts or, or um or looking at okay well acceptance uh, this you've got this pain and it's not nice so what can we do to move forward from here um yeah you know, what would make it a little bit better um and, and looking at some sort of ex- exploration of strategy um but not dismissing the pain i think it's very important to recognize someone's struggle and, and the struggle is beyond the pain it, pain is one aspect of the struggle but recognize someone's whole struggle and then trying to give them some sh- strategies around that but i think yeah. more often than not um i would absolutely recommend they go see a psychologist and and um and get themselves assessed accordingly what did you find helpful for you in terms of um the management of pain what specifically do you find helpful i think the enjoyable activities aspect is really good and and having a good understanding of what's actually going on in the body when you have pain i think the pain education piece is is pivotal in any good pain management because if we understand what's going on we tend to be less anxious um, and worried about it and so if someone can clearly explain how pain is working this is why you might be getting a flare-up this is what could happen and then put in place some strategies to, to help someone, give them that sense of control back. Uh, I think I think that's that's pivotal. And and part of that control is also doing enjoyable activities. I think people, you know, uh, for me, being able to do the things I enjoy again despite my pain gave me hope. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important to reintegrate that as part of the rehab strategy, not just an exercise program, for example. Just reintegrate someone to doing things they enjoy doing in some capacity. Uh, or manageable capacity to start so at least they can say oh okay well I can start here and I can see where I'm working what I'm working towards and goal setting isn't the other thing uh, I think Adrian that I think is really really important uh, setting some meaningful functional sort of smart goals so that people mm-hmm. got something to look forward to and and I'm very big on the message and it's a message that I'm sort of learned over the years myself is that it, the, the goals of intent not expectation so you don't have to put pressure on yourself to say i have to achieve it by such a day it's just an intention to achieve it and i think if you could take that message to your goal setting say okay well i'd like to be able to do this but there's no pressure for me to be able to do it by a certain date i think that'll be really helpful i know that uh, in your book you talked about some of the things that you've done which are absolutely amazing and one in particular with your uh well, you say it. So, I mean, obviously, so you then had pain, you recovered, you've obviously then become a, a, an expert in pain management. And then you obviously went over, you went hiking, you went um, trekking. Yeah, look, one of my childhood dreams was to trek the Himalayas. Um, I don't know, something about the Himalayas that always attracted me and um, just uh-huh. doing doing research and projects and things like that. And so when I had my collapsed lung, in 2005 they obviously said you know you've had lung surgery uh, uh don't do any high altitude stuff don't do any deep sea stuff and you know it's probably not safe etc and then you'll never be able to do the himalayas forget about it and then when i had the burns they're like oh with the chronic pain and the skin graft you know don't forget about doing anything high intense and you know i, I could then really i could relate to my patients or my clients where you know a lot of people have specialist and other therapists have told them they'll never be able to do this or they'll never be able to do that and it's quite deflating and then i thought mm-hmm. well why should someone decide what i can and can't do now obviously we need to be sensible and we need to be realistic but i you know i'm one of a big believer that we we should never put a ceiling on someone else's goals if someone has a goal let's just set it and work towards it and, and set the expectation that you may or may not achieve that goal, but hey, there's nothing stopping us from working towards it. So that's what I did. I, I sort of said, you know, there's no time frame for me to do 
Everest Base Camp. Um, it's something I'd always want to do, but I'll set myself a goal and, and a bit of a time frame, and I'll work towards it. And if I get there, awesome. If I don't, at least I've got my fitness. I work towards my fitness. So that, that's where that intention versus expectation comes in. Yep. Um, so yeah, and so you know, four years later, uh, I think it was four or five years later. Yeah, I, I managed to do Everest Base Camp. Um, it was tough. It was probably the toughest holiday I'd ever go on, but it was, geez, it was worth it. So, um, uh-huh. yeah. So that's interesting. So, so that happened what four or five years after the after the, the burns? Yes. Yes. Wow. Okay. And so, how do I say? It? I mean, it wouldn't have been physically pleasant at all, I suspect. But you did it. I mean, what's you know, how did you do that? Despite the pain that you would experience, obviously, you know, anybody, uh, you know, doing the base camp Everest, that's going to be a difficult, uh, physically exhausting experience. But for you, it would have been even more difficult. So, how did you overcome or work through that pain and still still achieve that? Look, I think it's about. Um yeah, it's something I always wanted to do, and there also needs to be some level of reality and pacing. So, you know, I was by far the slowest person to get to the checkpoint at the end of every day. <laughs> but so I just paced myself along the way. I wasn't going to push too hard. I wasn't going to make it uh, even more unpleasant than what it needed to be. But it's something. It was about the destination for me, um, and it's about. And, and for me, it was about okay. Well. You know, I wanted to make sure I, I was going at a pace that was manageable for me. I was able to take breaks when I need to take breaks, but make sure that I kept up with the rest of the group in some capacity so that, you know, I wasn't holding anyone up, but at the same token, I wasn't falling too far behind. So I think that's where the concept of pacing really comes into play and, and everyone's different and everyone talks about pacing and pain management, but I think it's a, just about looking at, okay, what do I need to do? And, and having a plan of attack to say, you know, don't don't be reactive in your response to pacing. You've got to be proactive. So taking breaks, even if you feel good, uh, sticking yeah. to the schedule as you as you are going to do it. Not just trying to say, oh, you know, I feel good. I might just do a bit more, because mm-hmm. then you're then you're not pacing. You're just you're just um, working to your symptoms, and that's not helpful because symptoms can change uh, for no reason. You know, what, what was your, I mean, you talked about cognitive behaviour therapy. So obviously our thoughts and, and what we say to ourselves affects how we, we feel and it affects our behaviours too. And then the other treatment that you talked about was acceptance and commitment therapy um, or ACT. And so um, acceptance yeah. of thoughts and feelings and working towards goals and, and values and things like that. So what kind of things were you saying to yourself when you're experiencing pain? I'm, I suspect there was probably times that you wanted to to give up. Um, were you, what, stra- what, what was your self-talk like during that process? Uh, yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, look, I, I think for most part I was like, okay, well, you know, if my best was in my position, what would I tell them to encourage them, you know? Um, mm. And... And also consider things like, you know, I've come this far, I've done this, you know, yeah, look, the, the, the pain was bad, but, you know, could it be worse? Yes. Could it be better? Yes. I am in the journey that I'm in and, and I still got a little bit further to go and I just got to keep going through it. This is something I knew I was getting myself into. I knew it was going to be tough. So to expect anything different, um, you know, will be insane. Um, so. Mm-hmm. It's something that I just wanted to feel like I was wanted to achieve. So, and and that's why when I suddenly talk about goal setting, it's not my goals as a therapist. It's got to be the client's goals, you know, because that that adds meaning to it. Um, so for me, if, if if it was a therapist who's saying, "Oh, you need to do this," I probably wouldn't have made it. Um, mm-hmm. But it's because I personally wanted to be able to do it. I found the means to put in place the strategies to then then do it. Yeah. And what do you think that was the reason? Why did you want to go to Everest? I mean, what was the meaning behind it for you? Oh, look, part of it was, I guess, my um, upbringing as as a Buddhist, but I think it's more nature. Like, I mean, it's, I guess it's raw nature. I mean, it's Mother Nature at her grandest, really. (laughs) And just to see those incredible mountains, they're huge. Like, we don't, we underestimate how big big these mountains are and you're just like this tiny ant um you know and you see a peak but the peak is nowhere near where you are but it looks huge it looks huge so 
Um, and yeah, I just felt uh, for for me the environment and the nat- natural aspect, the natural beauty of it was um, yeah it's something I wanted to experience. And uh, alongside the the Buddhism ac- aspect, I mean, you know, I, I I think of Buddhism more as a way of life rather than religion. Um, and mm-hmm. just that. The, just the life that these people live, they've got very little. It's very harsh environment, yet it's so happy, you know, um, yeah. and it just really brings home, you know, it's not necessarily the materialistic things. It's about mindset and, and what we want to make of life, really. That's important at the end. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I mean obviously, yeah, the, how we think and our values and our goals and and, you know, obviously there's one way where you can kind of manage pain, which is probably the more I say it, the more I kind of cringe at that word because it's it's a, it's about kind of living a life with pain, isn't it? It's about yes, um, despite having pain. Yeah, values. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, purpose and meaning. And, I mean, wh- how do you think your experiences have um, in terms of, you, you obviously, the, the 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 burns that you've experienced, the chronic pain that you've experienced, how does it how's it made you a better person? Do you think? I think it's gave me a lot of insight into the concept of the struggle, um, because the struggle is more than just the pain. It made me more aware of all the other factors that impact someone's life. You know, their personal life, their social life, their work life, the emotional, physical, um, and really look at the person as a whole rather than just that like I said before, like that painful body part or, or a diagnosis. Mm-hmm. Um, and and really it sets home that it, it's not about what me as a therapist want the client to be able to achieve. It really has to be about what the client wants to achieve. Yes, you might give them some guidance and encouragement and things like that, but it's got to be their goals. It's got to be their, it's got to be about them because it's that's what brings meaning to all of this. And when when it's when there's meaning behind what you do, it sort of targets your emotional centers more than your practical centers. And I think that 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 emotional center has a far greater drive um, mm-hmm. than just that pragmatic practical approach. Yeah, no. I mean, you mentioned earlier that you know, obviously um, doing things is, um, and I'm a big believer. I mean, certainly. Um, our thoughts, I think, is really important, and ha- how we perceive things and setting goals, and um, are extremely important. But certainly, what I think that a lot of the research shows is is it's actually action. It's actually engaging in behaviours that help you achieve a better life and a, a more fulfilling life. Um, and sometimes it's a more difficult life at times because you've got challenges in place. But you know, a lot of the research shows that. You know, the the most effective intervention for low mood is is do more stuff, um, and you can use all the self talk and and um, if you're not actually engaging in action, if it's not leading to behavioural changes, then it's it, often it's quite futile. So it certainly sounds like that you've engaged in several behaviours that have made your life um, richer. Yeah, absolutely, and it's vice versa, right? Like, I mean you talk about mind over body. So it's, it's that old concept of um, do you get fit and then go to the gym or do you go to the gym to get fit <laughs> sort of yep. sort of view, you know, like it's all interlinked. Like we can exercise to improve our mood, but also we can improve our mood to then get us to exercise. So mm-hmm. is one better than the other? I don't think so. I think we need to bring it together and that's why a holistic approach is needed. You know, yeah. um, you could, you know, you could adopt like uh, in in my workshops. I, I tell people, you know, you put your arms out, look up at the ceiling, and try and try and be angry. And you can't do it because that posture actually releases your endorphins and I guess oxytocin um, that stops you from being angry. But if you cross your arms and look down at the floor and hunch your shoulders over and try and be happy, you can't do it um, because. Mm-hmm. That, that that's a stress you know it's a it's a power stress um response and your body releases cortisol as a result so you can't be happy when you're when you're stressed so you know as much as our mood can impact our behavior our behavior can impact our mood so you can't have one without the other and that's why a holistic approach is really needed for good pain management okay now the other thing um i noticed or oh, well, it came out for me was the importance of you know s- social um, support and family support and uh, you know mm-hmm. 
I know that in your book your, your parents came out to visit you in, in England yeah. to spend some time with you. You had family supports. I mean, how, how important do you think are uh, social supports, family supports in terms of pain management? Really important. It's got to be a key pillar. Um, yeah, having chronic pain can be incredibly isolating um, because in, for most people it's an invisible illness and mm -hmm. a lot of people don't understand. And and I think having that support network around you, we, we need support network for when we're feeling down or going through other stuff. You need someone else to hold you up sometimes. And I, and I think especially with chronic pain where you're having it, in most instances on a daily occurrence and, and it's a struggle, I think having that support, external support network, someone else to try and support you at times of need is, is critical. So having good people around you that understands your condition not necessarily enables you to be a victim or be um, uh, incapacitated, not, not someone mm -hmm. who does everything for you. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying someone who can encourage you, can support you. Yeah, sure, help when you need it, but definitely still encourage you to become active, become independent, um, take take back some sense of control um, and feel more confident dealing with the pain. I think I think you need a support network like that. You, you talked earlier about um, pain education being important. Yeah. So do you also involve, you know, do you often involve the family in that educational process? Absolutely, yeah. I always offer my clients to have someone else, even more than one person, attend because the, it, there's a lot to take in, right? I mean, if someone's on a lot of medication or they've been struggling with pain, when you try and explain pain, um, and I do it in a very simplistic, easy to understand way using traffic mm -hmm. lights and uh, analogies and, and traffic, but um, it's still a lot to take on. And so I always encourage a family member or someone else to be there, one, so that they can have a discussion afterwards so that the, the person in pain can understand, but also for them to understand themselves because where do they get their training or where, where do they get their understanding? So if they understand that, hey, listen, it's they're not going crazy that the weather can impact their pain or the pain can be different sensations and this is what happens for that to occur, then it makes sense for them and it just reinforces what, person in pain is saying that their pain is real and it's there, you just can't, you might not be able to see it. Yeah, yeah, 100% agree with you. I think, you know, if there's, you know, obviously practitioners listening to this podcast today is, you know, really think about um, how much do you involve the family, the, the social supports, the significant others in the work that you do with your patients, uh, whatever condition it be, it be. Obviously today we're talking about pain oh. management, but um, education for the for the clients and also education for the family in terms of educating about the condition, but also how they can best support their loved one. And I think that's such a crucial component because the stresses that the client experiences will have an impact on the significant other and, and vice versa. So definitely have a think about, you know, the clients you're seeing and am I working with the families and do it, how do I incorporate them more? Because I, I, you know, certainly with your story, I, I saw that your family supports was extremely important in your recovery. Oh, 100%. Yes, I, I completely agree with you there. And I think it's 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 pivotal part of this whole process um, of recovery and, and and moving forward that someone has the good, good supports around them. Yeah. Now, what about um, from a chronic pain perspective, uh, physical activity, exercise? I mean, what's the go there with regards to somebody experiencing? I mean, obviously, I'm talking about chronic pain. It's a very general word. Obviously, there's all different conditions within that. But have you got any general advice around exercise and physical activity? Yeah. Look, I think for me, it's it is about starting slow. I think the first step is not about focusing on getting fit and active first step is about getting your body used to moving despite your pain. And so, and that's what a lot of people miss here. And, yeah. and uh, they go into the exercise thinking, okay, I've got to get myself fitter and healthier. But actually the first step is about getting your body accustomed to moving despite your pain. Um, mm -hmm. And so you've got to start slow and then build up gradually. And again, <clears throat> talking to someone who's got a therapist who's got pain management experience, setting up with a, coming up with a good plan um, and setting a good plan in place um, so that it, there's a graduated progression 
um, I think it's really important. Um, we we do that. We we start very very low and then slowly build up. You can always build up faster, but you don't want to start high and then struggle because then you're technically giving your brain and your body a negative experience, yeah. saying that oh geez exercise is trouble. I don't want to do this anymore. So mm-hmm. I think starting slow, giving some wins, building it up is really important. The other thing is. Make it meaningful. You know, it might be you start off with basic exercise at home, but you might be working towards walking or cycling or, you know, hiking or or doing something that's that's meaningful for for the client, um, and that can be again tied in with their goals and goal setting. So with um, the exercise components, I mean, certainly for me, if I was uh, seeing a patient with uh, a client with chronic pain, I would refer on. Is a, a particular specialty, obviously your physiotherapist, is that where we'd kind of refer on to look at the exercise intervention or is there other practitioners or uh, other specialists that you'd recommend um, to? Look, I would start with the physio. Um, certainly there are exercise physiologists and look, there are good physios, bad physios, good EPs, exercise physio, bad exercise physiologists, etc. But I, I, I think from a, given the clinical understanding that a physio would have, um, I think most important is a, a therapist with some pain experience, whether they're a physio and exercise physiologist. I think that's that's the first first thing. Second mm-hmm. thing is then out of the two, I'd probably start with a physiotherapist. And then once you've got a plan in place, absolutely, exercise physiologists are great. Um, and I think it'd be worthwhile, um, whether it's a physio and exercise physiologist, to continue with, with someone with pain experience. I think that's the key because they're, those people who's done some further training, et cetera, understands pain and pacing and, and the strategies that's required for good pain management. And that's not to take away from other therapists who might have had experience over years and years, but it just means that they might have some more specialist skills in this area. And so a referral to a physiotherapist, I mean, obviously you mentioned there's probably some exercise there. What's What up can other people expect you know, in terms of physiotherapists and, and chronic pain? What other interventions do physiotherapists yeah. offer? Yeah, it's really um, it's a really good point, and and it comes back to your um, what we discussed earlier about um, education and things like that. You know, I think a lot of physios feel worried that if we don't put our hands on a client or don't give them a certain exercise in a session, that it's not therapy. But it actually mm-hmm. is. You know, sitting down, educating someone about pain educating about how to do pacing, self-management strategies, you know, heat, eyes, tens machine, all that sort of stuff, setting up with an exercise program, relaxation techniques, you know, looking at some sleep strategies, et cetera, um, tying in, you know, doing the basics of maybe mindset. And I'm not certainly not taking the role of a psychologist, but even just introducing the concept of have you thought about how your mood can affect your pain and, and seeing whether an appropriate referral for a psychologist will be appropriate, an appropriate referral for a dietitian, if it's to do with their diet, weight, et cetera. Um, you know, I, that's all what a physio in pain management could do. And, and certainly what I do in my clinic, I, again, I look at a more holistic approach um, mm-hmm. and that's what we should be doing and referring off for additional supports as, as necessary. You mentioned sleep. So sleep, pain, what's the connection there? Well, um, the research unequivocally shows that if you have poor sleep, the next day your pain reports are generally high. And I think the sleep allows our bodies to calm and settle down. And, you know, less cortisol in your system in the morning, so um, you're you're more likely to have sort of less pain. So sleep is critical. like some of the other strategies, but we need good sleep. And, you know, people are hesitant about getting medications for sleep and things like that. And I always tell them, you know, if you get a good sleep, get your pain under control, your nervous system is less sensitized and less active and and, and, and alert. Everything can be calmed down a bit more. So sleep is really, really important. A lot of people with chronic pain who can't sleep, well, they'll often tell you that they feel like they're jet lagged the next day. Um, uh, as well, so you can't even think straight. Anyway, so um, yeah, trying to trying to get decent sleep is really critical for good pain management. So you've got if you've got somebody there that I mean, obviously, good sleep will um, have a positive impact on pain. Um, 
But if you've got somebody in there who's saying, look, uh, I go to bed and then after an hour or two I'm in, my back's killing me or I'm in, in significant pain and it affects my sleep, I then have to wake up, I can't fall asleep. What do you do with, with those clients who where the pain is significantly impacting on their ability to, to fall asleep or to stay asleep? Any suggestions there? Yeah, look, I mean, I think it, it is again about um, identifying what's causing them to wake up. Um, and if it is the pain, it could be a review of the medication or any sort of natural um, or, or supplements that they can take to help them with their sleep. Um, but certainly, um, you know, there could be other strategies like, is it putting a pillow between your legs if it's your lower back? Could be because you're sort of twisting up at night or moving around too much. Um, it could be various things. Adrian, so um, it's hard for me to say anything in particular, but I think you've got to look at, okay, have you got appropriate medication to help you sort of sleep and stay asleep with whether it's pain medication or, or sleep medication? Are there any supplements you can potentially take that might help you with that? Um, and yeah, looking at, you know, what are your postures like? Is there, what other strategies do you do before you go to bed? You know, it could be that you need to calm yourself, your body and your mind beforehand, do some relaxation, et cetera. Um, and what have you done through the course of the day and having a look at what you've done that might be um, contributing to the fact that you can't sleep and you're waking up yeah. an hour later because it's all built up through the course of the day. Yeah, I think it's great advice. I think, you know, often we th- we pr- provide advice on what to do once they've, you know, once they're in bed and fallen asleep, but it's you, you mentioned there about, you know, what things did you do during the day that might yep. have impacted on your sleep and, and that could be, your posture and how you're sitting and things like that could potentially affect your pain later on, couldn't it? Yeah, 100%. So, again, if that comes back to the concept of being proactive rather than reactive um, because reactive strategies take longer to implement rather than proactive strategies. So really identifying and keeping a track of, you know, you might track what you do for a week or two, you know, just not, it doesn't have to be hour by hour, but just a mm. weekly planner, you know, just to see what you get up to and see if, your activity levels, it might be that, oh, yeah, you're standing up a lot on a certain day and that night, normally the night after, yeah. you're struggling. Um, so finding patterns in your pain might help, um, but certainly being proactive rather than reactive. And the analogy I give is that you know, if you're driving a car and you refuel up every time that your, your um, indicator is on a quarter tank, you never run out of fuel because you've got the quarter tank in the reserve. But if you keep going until the red light comes on, you could get stranded. So being proactive in your strategies and doing it regularly, consistently is far better than waiting until the pain is really bad and then trying to deal with it. I think uh, I find a really good strategy for people is um, engaging in behavioural experiments. So often people will come in and say, look, you know, they believe that this thing it will make them feel worse or, or this behaviour will make them feel better or, or whatever. And... Uh, and using my experience and this and the information that I've kind of gleaned from the clients, I then think, okay, no, that doesn't quite make sense. So let's engage in a behavioural experiment. Let's kind of, Correct, yeah. you know, do if I would do two, more than 5,000 steps a day and my pain's worse, well, let's see. Let's, for the next week, engage in 5,000 steps a day and let's provide a rating every day. Um, yep. for your uh, pain and then see how that goes. It's an extremely powerful way to change people's thoughts and assumptions and uh, and beliefs. I, I completely agree with you. Um, yeah, I remember when I was in London and we were, we were in the pain clinic, people used to come in and say, oh, look, I've got back pain and I don't want to be in crowds because I get, I'm constantly getting knocked. And so we used to take them to, you know, Waterloo Station <laughs> uh, during peak hour and get them to walk straight out of crowd and show that people are actually trying to avoid you. People don't try yeah. and crash into you on purpose. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, all the people have fear of escalators and stuff and, you know, they don't want to get on just in case they trip up or things like that. And we used to do behavioural experiments where we get people to do it. But ag- agree, you know, and you could do that in a graded way, couldn't you? It's just like, um, you know, we talk about when you have an accident, you know, the best thing to do is actually get behind the wheel and start driving again sooner rather than later. Yeah. Um and, and, you know, trying to challenge that thought of, oh, no, I'll never be able to drive again uh, because if I drive again, I'll do this, this and this. So, um, 
Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely behavioural experiments has a definite role to play. And in from a functional perspective, you know, we get a lot of people who hurt their backs and things like that, and they don't want to go and lift whatever they hurt their back with. So we try and get them to do that in a controlled environment so that they can get their confidence up and see that, oh, well, actually, no, maybe it was just one of those things that that's occurred. It's not necessarily that particular item that, that hurt my back. Okay, so we've talked about obviously there's acute pain, there's chronic pain. We haven't really kind of gone into the difference too much today, but um, but certainly from a inter, uh, uh, intervention point of view, you've talked about you know physiotherapy, you've talked about dietitians, you've talked about potential um, medications that help support people's pain. You've uh, there's the psychological side, there's you know potential supplements to help with pain and um, and sleep potentially. So. Certainly, you've got all those. So you've got food, you've got sleep, you've got exercise, you've got psychological. Have I missed? You've got medical. Have, you, have I missed any other mindfulness specialist? Yeah, I guess mindfulness. That's a, yep. Yeah, but I, I yep. think at the end of the day, um, you know, we need to understand by definition, pain is not a sensation; it's an experience. Right, and that's why we need all these different aspects. So the actual physical sensation aspect of pain is what we typically call nociception, but mm -hmm. pain by definition is an experience, um, and so an experience culminates to not just the physical aspects, but also, you know, your past history, your current situation, anticipation of the future, what you may have heard, seen, felt. All those things comes together to create a pain experience. And that's why it's so unique to an individual because mm -hmm. no two people can ever feel the same pain. Um, they may be able to relate, but they can't feel it. So it, it's very much an individual sensation, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not uh, full bottle with regards to the research, but uh, you know, even if you expose people to, let's say you put their, their hand in freezing water, um, I suspect things like, um, their mood, uh, how they slept the night before, uh, the strategies they use to manage that pain while their hands in freezing water, all those factors can significantly affect uh, how long they keep their, their hand in the water and the pain sensation associated with that, even within that individual. Um, so correct. even from one and, day and to the next. Correct. And and their, the meaning of the cold freezing water, you know, what do they think it's going to do? Is it going to help them or is it going to harm them? You know, all yeah. these things um, actually play a huge part because if it thinks it's going to help them, they'll probably tolerate it longer. Uh, whereas if they think it's going to harm them, they're more likely to withdraw sooner. So, um, yeah. yeah, it all comes back to the meaning of, yeah, and and the whole, that whole, uh, the holistic approach to saying you can't just look at, we've got to look at the whole, the bigger picture, yeah. Now, if a practitioner is interested in learning more about helping clients with chronic pain, are there any resources or training or things that you rec recommend for them? Oh, look, there's, there's a lot of resources out there. I think Chronic Pain Australia for clients and clinicians is a, is a good, good start point. There's also courses, you know, um, that pain practitioners like myself, um, we run our courses. There's, you know, other bigger groups like Noi Group. Um, who run courses? So, and universities have post grads and and things like that that they and and short courses. Some of the hospitals um, run short courses on pain management. So, I think if there's an interest, it's not hard to find courses in it. I think the I, I think if you want to um, look a bit more holistic, I think you've got to look at courses that actually tackle the holistic approach, not like not just a intervention based approach where you're looking at mm -hmm. you know. Um, dry needling or or something like that. But I'm not saying that's not effective. Of course it is for some people. I'm just saying if you're wanting a more holistic approach, I think you've got to look at courses that tackle that. Brilliant. All right. We'll, we'll certainly add links to the, some of those different options uh, in the show notes. So, uh, And I'll certainly recommend your, your book too. I, I found it really insightful and uh, particularly with regards to your own personal experiences uh, being a a practitioner in the area and then a, 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 a patient in the area. It's just a, a great read for people to just help develop more empathy um, for clients. I think that's one of the toughest things is that often we can give people advice and we think it's just as, you know, it's just a matter of giving that advice and they'll engage in, uh, in, in the advice that we've given them. But the reality is there's a whole range of personal experiences and emotions and 
Um, and we haven't even talked about, you know, previous traumas and things that people have experienced that impact on their ability to engage in some of those actions. So, so definitely a recommendable. Yeah, look, if anyone's interested, um, I think uh, the Beyond Pain website's probably the best way to access that book. Um, and uh, yeah, we can get it um, shipped off to you. But um, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. For, that's very kind of you to say that. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Angel. I really enjoyed our conversation today. So, uh, you know, I, I really love your, your approach and, um, and you know, obviously you had a, a really traumatic experience and significant event in your life, which to me sounds like it's really impacted on your how you see the world and how you work with your clients and how you kind of live generally. So uh, I certainly thank you very much because I'm sure you have a significant impact on, on your clients that you see every day. Uh, thanks so much for having me. And look, I think a, a parting quote would be from Epic Titus, who said, it's not what happens to you, but how you react to it that matters. And I think if you can um, find ways to support people to respond to their pain so that they feel more in control, I think that will help a lot of people. And if you could take that sort of approach, I think that will help. Terrific. Thanks, Angelo. Thanks for your time. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening today. Don't forget that you can find all the show notes, transcripts, and other resources from today's episode on the FX Medicine website. I'm Dr. Adrian Lepristi, and thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. This podcast is intended as healthcare practitioner education only, and it is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts Spotify, or wherever you listen to FX Medicine, and share us with your family, friends, and colleagues.